Good morning, dear students. Uh, today we are going to talk about the role of women in uh, business law decision making. So the topics are going to be arbitration and board of directors. And uh, if we have some addition time, I will speak something about the international trade and investment. But uh, regarding those topics, we will uh, concentrate ourselves on some examples and I would like to hear what you think about that case that I'm going to talk about. So as I already uh, told you, uh, the topics are gender diversity in arbitration and gender diversity in corporate governance. So why these two topics? Because those are the two topics regarding the business law decision making. So there are many other topics and interesting ones actually uh, in the framework of business, business law, but regarding the decision making, these are only these two. So what about the arbitration? Uh, when we are talking about decision making, of course, I'm thinking on economic decision making because there are many other <laughs> spheres where decision making may be important, such as cultural, political. So again, we will concentrate on the economic decision making only. I am sure that you have all um, read or heard something about the arbitration. So uh, this is something which uh, where you have uh, can, of course, uh, resolve your disputes if you don't want to resolve your dispute before the court, because, for example, it is too long uh, and you don't want that. You would like some influence on uh, the issue. Who is going to be uh, the arbitrator that you nominate? So uh, then we may address the arbitration. Uh, the main principle, something which is the main characteristic, actually, not a principle, but it may be, is the party autonomy. So the parties have uh, much influence on the, especially, the nomination process of the arbitrators. So if you would intrude uh, on that process too much, even when you want to foster the gender diversity, you could really uh, attack the attractiveness of the arbitration itself. And this may even lead to, um, for example, turning to the court and not the arbitration by the parties. This is something uh, which is not uh, desirable in the business community. So we need to find some kind of balance uh, between the issue of diversity, uh, gender diversity and the party autonomy. So the principal question uh, which we may ask is, who should be the arbitrator, but we also need to see who are the arbitrators. In order to see who are the arbitrators, we can turn to the statistics. So I have chosen here uh, the statistics regarding the arbitration in London, ICC, Germany, and of course, ICSID regarding the investment arbitration. So uh, let us see these numbers and then we may speak who should be the arbitrators and what can we do uh, to improve the gender diversity regard, regarding the arbitrators in the arbitration. So women were 6.9% of 160 arbitrators appointed by parties. So. Uh, you should really uh, now uh, start to differentiate uh, regarding the process of elimination of arbitrators, uh, whether these arbitrations are, for example, ad hoc arbitrations or institution arbitrations. So the parties may uh, appoint arbitrators directly or through some third party, or they may rely on the institutions. So these are the institutional arbitrations. As I told you, the ad hoc are the opposite one. So here I made this difference in order for you to see uh, what are the statistics regarding the uh, arbitrators appointed by the parties versus the arbitrators appointed by the institutions. So as you can see here, so 19.8% of 162 arbitrators are selected by the London Court of International Arbitration. So as you may see, the percentage is higher with regards to the institution nomination. 
Again, in 2020, those are the numbers from the 2014. So I again compare them with the uh, more recent ones from the 2020. Uh, LCIA appointed female arbitrators in 45% of its appointments in arbitration, of course, pursuant to its rules. Again, th that is the help for the parties regarding uh, the nomination. When we are talking about ICC, uh, you will maybe be surprised that they there even weren't any statistics in 2014. But the things improved regarding the statistics because when you have these statistics, uh, this may be even the pressure on the institutions, especially on the institution to appoint more women. So uh, in 2020, uh, 23.4 uh, percentage were women, but they were 37 percent of all arbitrators, of arbitrators appointed by the court. So in total, 355 women, 42 percent were nominated by the parties, 40 by the ICC court and 18 by the co-arbitrators. So you remember if one party, for example, appoint one arbitrator, the other one appoint the other, and then those two arbitrators appoint the uh, president of the tribunal. I wouldn't say chairman, even this was uh, the term which was used in the older documents. So uh, again, as you may see the other statistics as well uh, regarding the ICC, 16% of the arbitrators uh, nominated by the parties in total were women, women and 28 of the arbitral tribunal chairs nominated by the co-arbitrators were women in 37% of the nomination appointments by the court. So it is either upon proposal of an ICC uh, national committee or group or directly. Uh, when I said that they, uh, uh, there weren't any statistics in IC ICC in 2014, this wasn't the isolated case. Uh, the similar were in German institution, uh, arbitration institutions. So there weren't any statistics in 2014 as well. But many things changed from that time. So today, and actually in 2020, more than 20% of arbitrators were women. And regarding, uh, lastly, but last not the least, uh, regarding the exit, so uh, regarding the investment uh, settlement uh, 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 disputes, uh, less than 6% in 2014 were women. And in 2020, there was an improval, so 17% were women. But all comprehending together of arbitrators, conciliators, and ad hoc committee members. So here in the investment arbitration, as you may see, uh, these are even uh, the uh, lower percentage of, of women uh, appointed in, in arbitration as arbitrators uh, than in commercial arbitration. Of course, uh, that these statistics that I have now shown you uh, are only concerning the arbitrators, but in the arbitration, uh, women can have many other positions and, as well, are, but I don't uh, have those statistics and we will not speak about that. For example, uh, how many women are the councils in the arbitration? But what is the uh, general uh, conclusion uh, when we have these statistics in mind. Uh, the conclusion is that definitely the institutions usually appoint more female arbitrators than the parties. So when we are thinking about the measures, you remember my previous question, who should be the arbitrators? If you would uh, demand something from the parties, uh, I told you the, uh, the attractiveness uh, of the arbitration may be put into question because the uh, parties, they want to have the arbitrators that they choose. But we can do something with the institutions because those are the institutions. And then uh, the questions what the institutions may do about this arise. So we should 
think what are the possible measures to improve this situation and how to improve the lack of diversity. Uh, the arbitral uh, community was not blind regarding this issue. So already in 2015, the pledge uh, was drawn up, uh, which actually had uh, many measures uh, which may improve the lack of the diversity in the arbitration. So as you may see here, I enlisted them. Uh, this is, for example, the fair representation of women in conference panels on arbitration. This is really easy to do. Then fair representation in the lists of potential arbitrators or tribunal chairs considered by parties and councils. So you should include the women on the list so everybody may choose from this list. Again, fair representation in rosters and potential candidates for arbitration maintained by states, arbitral institutions, so this is what the arbitral institutions may do also, and national committees. Then appointment of women wherever is possible. Again, disclosure of gender statistics. All the institutions now do that, and this is very important, and also providing mentorship for women. I, of course, I put here the possibility to introduce quotas in arbitration, but this is actually not advisable, again, because of the nature of the arbitration, alternative dispute resolution. So why we uh, would do something too much intrusive? I already uh, told you the arguments regarding the party autonomy, and that would be, I would say, inappropriate. But all those other uh, potential measures are available and are desirable. Uh, why did I also mention the, this mentorship for women? I don't know uh, whether you are aware of the phenomenon called leaking pipe. I, heard, I think that you uh, heard about that. Uh, when starting their professional careers, there are many women but when you are going to the uh, higher levels, and especially at the top levels, there are much less women there men, than men. The reasons, of course, may be different, but I would here emphasize the so-called double burden for women. So the domestic obligations and, of course, the professional obligations. But also there is another phenomenon which is again uh, not uh, doing so much good for uh, this issue in the arbitration and this is the so-called vicious cycle. And that's why again I'm emphasizing on this providing mentorship for women. So the parties and even the co-arbitrators and even sometimes the institution, uh, institutions they appoint and they like to appoint the experienced arbitrators. And that is the vicious cycle. How you can at all appoint a woman if she didn't have any chance to get this experience and to be an arbitrator. And again, you would turn to the um, experienced ones and then uh, if there are few women which are experienced, who are experienced in the arbitration, you can always again appoint them. And those are the same women or there are no women at all. And that's the problem with the vicious cycle. And that's why I'm saying that these measures are very important. So not only the stati statistics, but the lists of potential candidates, which should include candidates without uh, an experience, but with the proper education, for example, with providing the mentorship and when possible, appoint them. For example, uh, if, um, um, if, for example, the uh, other party did not appoint the arbitrator, the institution should do that, the institution may appoint the woman. So uh, this is one of the possibilities how to improve the lack of uh, diversity. 
And I would now finish with the issue of arbitration and I would skip to the, let's say, uh, even uh, uh, more, uh, 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 even hotter topic, as I may say, uh, because of the recent development at the EU level. And maybe uh, you will hear uh, today, many of you, I believe, for the first time, some new uh, things which happened uh, in the European Union since uh, uh, in the late November last year, the new directive regarding this issue was adopted. So this is completely something new, but uh, only, of course, the development is new, but the problem is very old, and we were all aware of this problem uh, uh, for a long time. So when we are speaking about the women directors, we are again on the field of their nomination and appointment. So because we are talking about the directors, so the seats in the board of directors, we are on the field of company law and especially corporate governance. Because uh, this uh, uh, company law and corporate governments uh, regulate and analyze, of course, uh, these issues, uh, the gender perspective also has to be mentioned because a composition of the board is the issue of the corporate governance. For those who are not uh, familiar with these terms, uh, for company law, it's easy again, of course, to understand what it comprehends. Uh, I have just uh, 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 chosen uh, one famous definition of corporate governance, uh, which really explains enough uh, from a 1992 Cadbury report that corporate governance is system by which companies are directed and controlled. And that's why this is the topic of economic uh, decision making is business law. So you have a women as a very important persons who direct and control the companies. And that is why uh, this is a very important uh, and uh, sometimes uh, controversial topics, especially when it comes to the executive directors, so the persons who manage the company from day to day, who um, uh, decide on daily basis. So definitely besides this um, board composition and therefore the board diversity regarding the corporate governance in total, there are also uh, two more topics regarding the remuneration of directors which need to be addressed from this specific issue. Again, some new things happened at the EU level and as I'm aware, uh, you will have some lectures uh, in the uh, labor law section. So I believe that you will speak about the director or, uh, directive on equal pay, which is also important for the topic of the directors in uh, company law. So a remuneration of directors and also the disclosure of remuneration policy are very important topics. So you have board composition and remuneration as the primary topic. So now I will um, address uh, one very as I told you, there are some controversial issues, and uh, this is one of that. Uh, them. Is there any economic rationale to foster gender diversity? Actually, economic rationale is mentioned in the new directive. It was mentioned even in the proposal from 2012 as a reason to foster gender diversity. But in the theory, in many uh, analyses that were and surveys that were taken, uh, the conclusion was that there is no clear link between economic rational, uh, meaning better performance of the company, and gender diversity. Even if there is such a link, a link because there were some surveys that said. Yes, they are. They were, there were others which said, no, there is no such link. Uh, 
there were even some uh, surveys that said that this may even, uh, uh, meaning fostering gender diversity, would even mean uh, uh, doing negative on economic performance of the company. Because if you have too much heterogeneous uh, board of directors, you need more time to make decisions. And even it's sometimes very hard to reach a decision. And that may be too slow for the fast business life. And that's why sometimes uh, the performance of the company when uh, may be put into a question. And therefore, the issue of economic rationale for fostering gender diversity is, as I told you, quite controversial. But still... Even though there is no clear link between board diversity and corporate performance, uh, this was mentioned, as you see here, in 2011 Green Paper, EU Corporate Governance Framework, uh, especially uh, the economic rationale, and also the increase of transparency on board diversity policy uh, was also mentioned in 2012 in Action Plan, European Company Law and Corporate Governance, a modern legal framework for more engaged shareholders and su su uh, sustainable companies. So uh, the European Commission actually later on accepted this, even though I told you there is no such a clear link. So we have many studies showing different results. But still, we shouldn't uh, uh, let's say, emphasize the economic rational so much, even though this wasn't also very important and uh, the most important reason, for example, to improve uh, the uh, management of the company uh, when uh, independent directors were included in the uh, corporate government uh, uh, in general and company law as an important part of it, it still happened. So we all accepted independent directors. So why wouldn't we accept the issue of gender diversity as well? There is no clear link, so what? There wasn't clear link with the independent directors as well. So this is not a benchmark. This is not the first time for the company law. And therefore, I would say that we should turn to other reasons, not economic rational. Of course, we have to be aware. Some really believe in this. Some don't. Some uh, say that this is even, I told you, a negative, uh, uh, a negative issue uh, regarding the uh, board composition. So what are these other reasons for fostering gender diversity. It is a fundamental right of equality between men and women, and most importantly, ethical reasons. So we don't need a justification regarding the economic rationale because it was not the first time for the company law and corporate governments. So we can turn to these two reasons as the uh, main one, ones and uh, the reasons which are enough. So why there was and there is still a need to do something? Again, we have to uh, see the statistics as we did in arbitration. So you saw, especially in investment arbitration, that there are some low numbers of women uh, appointed as arbitrators. You will see what is the situation uh, in a board of directors. So in the EU, you can see how the things developed from 2003 till 2022. So we have a really good source for this information, for these data. You can see them by yourself. Uh, An European Institute for Gender Equality. So you should go to the uh, business decision making and you can see the board of directors, the directors, the president, everything you will find there. So. Uh, again, what I didn't tell you is that uh, the companies uh, which are analyzed are always the listed companies because those are the most visible companies. Their shares are listed on the stock exchanges. So those shares are uh, accessible to all of us. And that's why 
they are visible. They are always very large companies, uh, many employees. Uh, so therefore, all those companies are the ones which are analyzed. So regarding the uh, women in boards of listed companies, I explained the uh, term, which are registered in the EU. So this is for the EU. 2003, it was 8.5. And now it is 32.3. So there was, uh, this is a huge improvement. And you see uh, 2010, 11.9, 9, 23.9 in 2016, 30% in 2020, 31.3 in 2021. So this is the development. The development is good regarding the board of directors. And maybe you are going to be uh, uh, surprised with these uh, statistics regarding the uh, states, regarding the states uh, which are uh, comprehended by the uh, survey. So the best results are achieved in France. So the France is the best one. Uh, 46.3% percent of uh, presidents, board members and employee representative are uh, women. But the lowest is achieved in Estonia, only 8.3 percentage. Uh, when we are talking about the women which are uh, CEOs, so we are talking about again top levels, now the company, the CEO, uh, uh, including both executives and non-executives. Executives, I will explain why this is very important, the position of the director. The best results are achieved in Sweden. Those are the most recent uh, statistics and data. Uh, the percentage is 27.5. And the lowest is achieved in Luxembourg. I was surprised as well. It was only 4.3 percentage. This is really, really low. But again, we have to have in mind that this is CEO, CEOs, executives and non-executives. So all of them. So I already mentioned uh, that uh, so-called double burden is one of the definitely reasons why these statistics are like this. But regarding the uh, women directors and their underrepresentations is not only that. Uh, definitely, it may be the result of the special position of the directors because you need to be mobile. And even if you are elected, appointed as director, for example, you have to take some maternity leave, you will not probably be, be re-elected. So, the mobility and the specificity of the position are also the reasons of the underrepresentation of women as directors. So you need the mobility and you need the continuity. You need years to improve the management of the company. And sometimes women may not do that. Uh, what about Serbia? I also uh, uh, put here these statistics because it was very interesting for me. Um, index of gender equality in Serbia in 2021 was the source, but the data are from 2018. I couldn't find uh, more recent data from the Statistics Office of the Republic of Serbia. So 17.3% uh, of women were appointed in the uh, board of directors in the listed companies. Again, those listed companies, as I explained, in 2014. Uh, this number was improved, but not much, because in 2018, so the most recent statistics, it is only 19%. And in 2016, I also found this, it was 19.3. So even we have a decrease uh, from 2016 till 2018. I don't know what happened, but those are the data. When it comes to the uh, data collected uh, by the Serbian Business Register Agency, you may also find this uh, data on those links and websites. I put them on the slides. In December 
2020, as you may see, 22.6% uh, uh, were women of all representatives and or directors. And 69.9% uh, uh, were men. And we also have this uh, uh, data in the same statistics that 7.5 of them were foreigners. But you may see this stark difference between the uh, percentage of women and men uh, regarding uh, this data from Serbian Business Register Agency, which really shows the underrepresentation of women in Serbia in December 2020. So when we now know the statistics, which is various, so many countries, many different experiences, I would like to address the issue what has already been done at the EU level. So you may see here the development and enlisted all the actions which were taking in the EU. Starting from 1984, uh, when the recommendation number 635 on the positive action for women was adopted. Of course, as you may see, not all of them are uh, regarding um, company law only. Those are, uh, let's say, broader measures, but they are important uh, from the company law perspective because you will see we will have to address the positive action because it is one of the measures uh, which is included in the newest EU directive. In 1996, uh, the recommendation on the balanced participation of women and men in the decision-making process also was adopted. And I told you, decision-making process is not only relevant for business law, for economic decision-making. So it may be, for example, political. That's why I'm saying this is broader, but the company law issues, the business law issues are included. In 2011, Women on Board Pledge for Europe was launched, so you can uh, compare this with the arbitration and with the community arbitration uh, for the arbitration uh, where the similar uh, uh, pledge was launched in 2015, so only four years later. Again, in 2011, uh, the resolution on women in business leadership of the European Parliament urged companies to reach 30% of women in boards by 2015 and 40% by 2020. But you will see there were uh, a process which really uh, um, slowed the process of adopting the newest directive from 2022, from November, which I already mentioned. So we was, were waiting from 2012 when the proposal for a directive on improving the gender balance among non-executive directors, I'm emphasizing this, of companies again listed on stock exchanges and related measures uh, was drafted. And afterwards in February 2022, German and Dutch governments supported the directive and in January also to, uh, uh, 2022, President von der Leyen also announced the termination to move forward with it. But nobody actually believed. Yes, please. Maybe you can finish this unit uh, of presentation but, and then uh, respond me. The whole, the, the whole time uh, during the spring school from different perspectives we have this <laughs> issue and interrelation of the quantita quantitative uh, indicators and the matter of quality. So, and some uh, lecturers did consider also the issue why this parity is important from this or that perspective, yeah. from the taxing, budgeting, uh, political decision making, etc., etc. So, what is the main point of an importance of um, raising the percentage and the, the number uh, of women being uh, 
in those higher levels of decision making in companies, in businesses. So at some moment it would be really extremely important that we understand. So that yes. a matter of more sources, more talent is more opportunities, different ideas, et cetera, et cetera. What are the main reasons? Actually, not uh, necessarily that, now, but that uh, I think is you owe us. Yeah. Uh, yes, actually, us yes, of course, discussion. because these numbers, more or less, they are going uh, in better, better. better they are becoming better and better. And better. But why is that so important? Actually, no, uh, but we should want to have elaborated. Of course, but actually, I already uh, uh, spoke about that. So, I, but I will. Uh, uh, get back to this. So when we are talking about business decision making, as I already uh, uh, told you, but this is really important and it, this should be repeated. Although the economic rationale, so the economic performance of the company is mentioned as a reason why we should improve the gender diversity in the board of directors. Uh, uh, when analyzing all the studies which have been undertaken uh, on this issue, uh, uh, it may be concluded that there is no clear link between the economic rationale, so the business performance of the company, and the gender diversity. So some studies, they say, yes, there is, and the others, there is no connection. But these studies which address the connection in a positive way, so they believe in this connection. Uh, some of them uh, think that this is positive, some authors of these studies, but some found it negative. So uh, higher board diversity may even lead to the negative business performance. Also, and negative in the sense that, uh, that company... Inefficiency uh, of decision making. Yeah, uh, no, no, no. But uh, the economic uh, rational means the performance of the company. The idea why the investors, the shareholders are investing, buying the shares is because they would like to profit. So mac uh, profit maximization is the idea of investment. So they would like to appoint the director directors they want, especially when it comes to the executive positions. And there is, also, of course, an issue how you may even and what you may do for the investors uh, to appoint a women director if they don't want because they vote on that. So you have a company, you have shareholders and they vote, vote on this. So this is a problem. And that's why I, I said this is not the most important aspect. We shouldn't only address the economic rational. Why? I even have an explanation. Because this has already been done in the corporate law regarding the independent directors. So when the independent directors were launched as something super, they were superstars in the company law, there wasn't any economic rationals for that as well. But they are now completely accepted as a necessary part of company law. Nobody questions them. There are so many analyses and studies. So why wouldn't we do the same for the gender diversity? So we definitely should turn to the fundamental right of equality between men and women and also the ethical reasons when addressing these topics. So my belief is that the economic rational is not the most important and should not be the most important. Of course, I'm very aware that on one hand, you have a right to property, a right to conduct business. That's what I said. So you conduct the business, you invest, you choose your directors because you want a profit maximization. You want your uh, the dividend distribution. But on the other hand, you have this fundamental rights, equality, men and women, and also ethical reasons. And this is something which is accepted in the part of the uh, legal literature, as I may say so. So those are the possible views, but some, and EU Commission as well, they address economic rational as a reason. But as I told you, I read so many studies, there is no clear link.
we cannot say this is definitely for sure that if we have uh, uh, if we foster gender diversity regarding the composition of the boards, you will improve the performance of the company. No, there is no such a clear link. But my point is that there shouldn't be. So this shouldn't be the most important point and issue. Yes. Yeah, I would just like to add, I attended um, one year ago a uh, pro, uh, project management uh, co uh, course, like a certificate in, at Google. And Google is especially stressing the importance, not only of gender equity in the board, in all sectors, et cetera, but intersectionality. It's promoting it to the greatest depth, the, the policies, uh, policymaker within the Google, et cetera, for the talents, for the economic growth, for everything, of course. We we can take into consideration, I mean, Google is what, what Google is and how Google spreads. It's becoming really a global company that is investing in everything. Google is only is, is also working on uh, dismantling this uh, like need for, um, how should I say, need for university education in order to enroll and become part of the Google, which is this class moment, which is very important in United States, especially because it's very expensive and educate formal education gives you only the members of the high strata it doesn't necessarily mean that it have it has given you talents and google is especially there is one i mean several lessons were were directed to this how should say, uh, how should say uh, corporate culture and the culture of diversity and the culture of accountability etc so it's like uh the one of the, the most important values of the corporation, of the Google. I mean, so if we, if we dive in into statistics, maybe data won't say that each company is, uh, how should I say, getting benefits from this. It's very uh, different if we want to compare, for instance, um, clinical research corporations. Of course, you need to have education to be highly educated, medicine, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very different. But... Uh, I should say, uh, like these global companies, which are in IT sectors, etc., are promoting this, not only dismantling the formal education, which we see. I mean, formal education is in crisis, and a lot of these courses are emerging now. People can educate it throughout their lives. It doesn't necessarily mean where were you born, in what status you will rest in that status, which is really good. So this is just one perspective, which I gained from my my part of education where I attended. This was like a new niche that was opened because I was raised in, in that uh, opinion that uh, what I chose when I was 18 years old, that's it for the rest of my life. So there is no change. You cannot change. You cannot go to other job, other position, try anything new. And I mean, new developments in economy, global economy are you're going into that direction. So this like huge investment of talents from all fields is like, yeah. Okay. That's yeah, my Anna, just comment. Just yeah. to add, maybe that puts the question, poses to us the question, especially to that some uh, sort, some kinds of companies like Google, which has not been only the global, but also uh, tends to match, to, to reach very di diverse subjects across uh, the globe. So maybe there it's very logical and also from uh, the profit making perspective to have diversity, yeah. not only in uh, gender, but in, in intersectional and, and gender perspective. So maybe we can think also about that criteria, some kinds of firms maybe yeah, I mean, clearly also need this diversity. As I, as yeah. uh, if I may answer, yeah. uh, so uh, definitely I agree. But then you have different problems because uh, what is maybe something that we don't have in mind at, at the first sight. This is the top position. For example, CEO, executive. So if you don't have an education, that's okay. But then you will have to have some experience. 
So why would somebody appoint you in the, on the top level of such a company? And how can you get some experience if this is, again, not possible, as I told you, this vicious cycle? I will also give you uh, one very interesting example when we are talking about that. Um, this is called golden skirt phenomenon. When you uh, adopt quotas, for example, and this happened in Norway, so many companies had to appoint women to reach some percentage uh, of women in the board of directors. Do you know what happened? You wouldn't, you wouldn't think of that. I was really surprised. Uh, when the survey was uh, undertaken, uh, they noticed that many women appointed as directors had the same surname as the male directors. So they all put their wives and the members of the family on those positions. So this is the exact data from Norway. So you have so many things. And there is also one more phenomenon. Uh, maybe you also was thinking of that, but maybe you didn't, uh, um, uh, you didn't know about the exact term. Uh, it is called group think phenomenon. So that's, I think, uh, your, it, it is very important, and I completely agree. And it is, uh, let's say, one of the reasons for fostering gender diversity. And that is actually the accepted reasons in some of the documents at the EU level when thinking and speaking about the uh, board diversity policy. Because today it is very modern and it is needed to have the policy if you are a large listed company. If you don't have this policy, then you have to provide the explanation. But who is drafting that? Again, the directors. Because this is again uh, the part of the manager, uh, managerial report. So we again come to the same, to the same let's say, uh, problems when it comes to the top levels. As I told you, the continuity, the mobility, uh, and of course the double burden, and this uh, that you have a right to conduct the business, of course, right to property, right to party autonomy principle, for example, because you may uh, have to be able to conclude to sign a contract with the exact person that you want to. So there are many, let's say, problems in the company law. And that's why I'm saying uh, that I wouldn't go to this uh, definitely economic rationale and profit making. But this group tick phenomenon for the uh, biggest companies, largest ones, this is really uh, uh, a good reason to foster and these others which I told you about. So I agree uh, with, uh, with your reasons and I think that they are really useful. Of course, as you said, there are some uh, business operations that need some special knowledges, but again, uh, not too much because if you are a CEO, you have to have um, uh, managerial uh, attribute, attribute. So again, it is not this and it is not education, but I would say it is the experience and there is the problem. I think that that is the problem because how can you get an experience to be in the top level position if nobody appoints you? And that's why I really believe that we need to have some measures to improve the gender uh, underrepresentation of women. Uh, uh, mostly in these uh, for these positions. So um, I would go to that. I will stop with the statistics, and but I need to tell you uh, this uh, last two points of this uh, slide, which is um, which is covering the actions uh, undertaken at the EU level. The directive um, on gender balance among uh, directors of again listed companies and related measures, so improving the gender balance, uh, is adopted in 2022. Finally, I definitely say finally after 12 years. So the adopted document is not the same uh, as the uh, proposal. And what you, what you should also know is why this is so sensitive in company law perspective, because 
uh, rules on structure of uh, you see here of bodies and management of companies are not harmonized in EU level. So this is somehow a side way uh, to intrude this issue which is uh, considered controversial and there is no clear clue and that this will be harmonized actually uh, in near future or at all. There were so many tries and ideas but nothing happened. So this is what is interesting. Actually, from the gender perspective, we have now some rules for the directives, directors. So what we can do? So this was my idea to see what is the uh, uh, state at this moment and what we may do and what is the best to do. So what are the possible solution? solutions? I enlisted them from the least intrusive ones to the most intrusive ones. So we start from the pool of candidate of the underrepresented uh, represent, uh, represented gender as the least intrusive measure because it may increase the possibility the possi probability of the selection of uh, women. Uh, what also I wanted to mention here because it is very interesting, this may not prevent that a uh, golden skirt phenomenon that I told you. It cannot do that because these women may only may be also included in these pools. Uh, so it may be uh, prevent because there are so many women and you can choose some other one. But what it may not prevent is so-called gender matching heuristic. This is also something very interesting. I wasn't aware of this phenomenon before. Uh, and until I didn't um, read many things about this topic. So if you replace the director, statistically, the new director who is going to be appointed will be the same gender as the one replaced. I was really surprised. But this is a phenomenon called gender matching heuristic. And even if you have a huge pool of candidates, of underrepresented, uh, underrepresented gender, this may not prevent this potential problem when it comes to the gender perspective. But as I told you, it may prevent golden skirt phenomenon because you know that this is a, have to be women. But okay, it shouldn't be the same woman in five companies, for example. And then, so uh, that's uh, that is also happening in arbitration. Those are the same women which are again appointed, and this is also happening in the um, in, uh, board of directors. And that is also, let's say, the golden skirts phenomenon. Uh, then what also may be done? Promotion of gender equality, drafting of programs of training, and also rewarding the companies with best results. This is more intrusive, but not intrusive too much. Policy on diversity, this is accepted, as I told you, at the EU level. And disclosure of statistics, this is again something which is happening. And also, very important thing, transparency of selection process. So, but this is again limited, you know. If you uh, have women who apply for the position of the director and a man, then you can, of course, uh, you can think about this process. You, this process need to be transparent. But what if women does not apply? You cannot do anything with this. So I wanted to say every measure has some aspect that is limited. And the most intrusive ones are quotas and also the most uh, accepted ones. But there are two types of quotas. I don't know, has anybody told you this? There are some voluntary quotas. It means that they are not followed by sanctions. So you need to achieve the number of seats in the uh, board of directors till 2025, for example. So this is a target. But what will happen if not? Nothing. You will from provide some information, some report, so it is not followed by sanctions. So it is a voluntary quota. 
On the other hand, we have mandatory quotas. Uh, so these quotas are followed by sanctions. So if you don't meet the quota, you will bear a sanction. And there is a mixture also. I didn't know that also, but I was reading and I think in Netherlands and also in Serbia, you will be surprised when it comes to the company law, you have the mandatory quotas prescribed by law because of course in company law you know that many measures may be also pre prescribed by soft law you heard about soft law yes and the division of soft law hard law okay uh, so uh, here some measures are prescribed by law and they are mandatory but again there is no sanction so this is a really strange mixture so uh, it is like uh, mandatory quota without any fees. You cannot do anything. So it's again more voluntary quotas. But voluntary quotas are mostly prescribed by uh, soft law. Some codes, corporate codes. Uh, again, some uh, data. Eight EU member states have national quotas from 25, this is the range, till 40%. 10 have taken softer approach and 9 have not taken any substantial measure. Again, you can find this information and in report on gender equality in EU in 2022. This is uh, now one slide on um, directive from 2012. I would suggest because the new directive is adopted, we may skip this because this was a proposal, some things are adopted, some things are not adopted. So I would go to the US directive because we have half an hour and I, I would like also to mention one case in the investment. If you agree, we should skip to the 2022 and my, uh, my presentation is available so you can see the point there. So what about the long-awaited directive finally adopted? You see, the name of this directive is again different uh, than, than the uh, proposal because it speaks on the improvement uh, of uh, gender diversity. It covers both, but not in the same way, um, non-executive and executive directors. What are the basis for delivering, adopting this directive? Article 2 of the EU, uh, the union is to, to promote the equality between the men and women. Article 157, um, the power to adopt measures to ensure the application of the principle of equal opportunities and equal treatment of men and women in matters of employment and occupation. So here, I also believe that uh, Professor Kovacic will say something about this, but I will have to have to just briefly mention some problems regarding the corporate law. So are the directors considered workers? It is not a problem when it comes to the executive directors, you know, because uh, employment contract may be, of course, signed. But if you have non-executive directors. And what is the relationship between the term employment and occupation? We have the Denosa case. We know for the executive directors, but for the non-executive, uh, it is pretty questionable. But let us assume that they are covered and even we see uh, that uh, the 2022 directive is based on these articles. And also, again, positive action that I told you is accepted in this. Uh, because the largest companies, which, uh, which are the most uh, profitable investments, as I may say, are listed companies, this directive applies to them. But even if the uh, company is large and not listed, it shouldn't be covered by the directive. And of course, if those companies are small and medium sized and they are listed, they are not covered by the directive, if you understand me. So only the large listed companies are covered by the directive. So the most visible, visible ones, the most influenced ones on the market. So who 
and which country uh, is competent to regulate the matters covered by the directives. Uh, this is the member state where uh, the company has its registered seat. So registered office, I will not talk about this complicated issue, just remember that this is the registered office so we know where is the registered office. Uh, this is a minimum carbonization measure which means that those are only the minimum requirements which are set by, di by the directive and of course that the member states may, may include uh, other measures as well. So what are the uh, quotas? Quotas, I'm saying like this. Uh, so members of underrepresented sex have to hold at least 40% of non-executive directors by uh, June the 30th of 2026. So you see, the percentage is pretty high. As I told you, the range at the national level is from 25 till 40, so this is the highest. But it uh, relates only to the non-executive directors. But if the state does not want to apply this target and this quota, it may uh, include in its legislation the other alternative measure. This alternative measure means that at least 33%, and now you should pay attention, of all director positions, so executives and non-executives, both of these groups, uh, by the same date should be this uh, 33%. So you can choose what to do. Should it be only the non-executive directors or then it is a 40%, which is the target of the percent of the women, which should be because it is, un they say underrepresented sex. So it is both, but we saw that in the reality, these are women or it should be all director positions. Why I'm saying and emphasizing these all directive positions? Because companies and shareholders, they don't, of course they do care, but not at the same extent for the non-executive positions as for the executive. Because the most important is who is the executive, who is doing day-to-day -day business, daily jobs, and that's why I told you it is important that the executives may be called workers. So they uh, come under the uh, directive that Professor Kovacic, I believe, the newest one on equal pay, uh, will be uh, covered. This is connected with the company law, but it is, of course, more labor law issue. So companies which are not subject to the objective regarding all directive positions. So desirable is to go to this 33% of all director positions because we need to touch these executives because there is the main problem. They have to set individual quantitative objectives with a view to improve the gender balance among executives. Uh, by the same date, June 13, 2026. Be so you see, the easiest is to go to the non-executive directors. If you don't want that, if you have good gender balance statistics, for example, you saw Sweden and France, you can go to the all board members' positions. But if you don't choose that, again, you will have to put some individual quotas for your, you as a uh, a company will have, for example, to meet quotas of 25% till that year. And, of course, the application of this rule, this rule regarding the uh, individual quantitative objective regarding the uh, executive positions, may be suspended if some uh, requirements are met. So, you may see uh, uh, this on this slide. So, uh, if uh, the conditions regarding the member of underrepresented sex are fulfilled so that they hold at least 30% of non-executive director position or at least 25 of all director positions or member state national law requires those proportions and includes um, effective proportionate and dissuasive enforcement measures if 
there is some non-compliance with these targets and requires that all listed companies, which are not covered with that rules, set individual quantitative objectives for all directive positions if all those conditions and requirements are met uh, by 27 December of 2022, because, as I told you, I think it was 23rd, uh, November 23rd, that when the directive was adopted. If this is fulfilled, then from the previous slide, this second point is suspended. If you start not to fulfill these requirements, uh, you have uh, six months and you have to apply these rules. So after uh, the time that you no longer fulfill those. Which are the means to, uh, to achieve these objectives? So again, just to summarize, maybe it's complicated, who is not so, let's say, involved in company issues. The one is regarding the executive positions, the second one is regarding the all positions, and the third one to the individual uh, uh, set of requirements regarding the all positions. Okay, so you have these alternatives and possibilities. So which are the means? It is uh, uh, the positive action, the so-called positive measure, giving uh, the possibility uh, and the access of women to the same right holding by men. So, in the selection process, if you have the candidates, the candidates which are equally qualified, you should give the priority to women. So, that is this positive action. So, I would like to ask you, what do you think? So, uh, if you have this measure, may we call all those measures that I mentioned regarding the percentage quotas or not. If you remember what I told you, what are quotas? What do you think? What is the measure? Uh, does the directive adopt the quotas in its essential meaning or not? Check your Chat, chat is not working or something. I, I have chat later on and nothing happened. I will go. I will go. No, no. More. I will go. No, there is nothing in chat. There is nothing in chat. I was, I opened it. Okay, of course, uh, everybody who is um, listening online, uh, you can join to our discussion, of course, if you are willing. So uh, maybe this will help. Uh, you can um, look at the last point from this slide. Uh, so which are the penalties from the uh, infringement of the rules? Uh, the penalties are uh, imposed only uh, when individual quantitative objectives are not man, uh, met. That means for the company itself, for example, as I told you, 25%. So individual, not that first alternative and second alternative, if you remember. So if the means to objective are uh, not uh, met, and if you fail regarding the reporting, because you, of course, have some obligation regarding the uh, reporting. Now, maybe I helped you too much, but I would like to see what do you think? So you have this positive action regarding the selection process. You have the sanctions only regarding the, uh, regarding the individual quantitative objective, means to achieve the objective. So it means what? The positive measure and uh, the reporting. 
So is this a quota? What is well, met? It is, it is. It is, you think? It is, yes, I would say, but in a, in a, like a combination of uh, voluntary and mandatory, because you have extension, it's now, I mean, it, it, directive is a bit of, like, how should I say, um, Missing. Recommendation. Recommendation how to achieve something without strict pressures, measures at that moment because uh, the deadline is 2026. So it's, uh, yes. it's a bit more lenient than quotas, how should I say? Quotas are like, at this moment you need to have this, always uh, this number of, of uh, this percentage. And this is like some directive, so I would say that, uh, I mean, definitely there is a balance that is introduced in percentage I'm of the presentation, so it is some type of quota. But. For this individual quantitative objective, but when the objective is individual, what does it, it mean, depends, uh, it depends on you, so it is not set, the percentage is not set by the director. I'm trying now to go back to the previous slide, but I uh, have a problem with that because nothing works for the previous slide. So now I'm trying to go back, ah, here it is. So you see here, the first point. Uh, at least 40% of non-executives or at least 32% of all directive uh, positions. And the second, companies which are not subject to this second point, 32% of all directive positions, they need to set individual quantitative objectives. And only for this individual quantitative objectives, so in, uh, regarding the executive uh, directives, directors, this is the main thing, they need to do this and only there is uh, a sanction if you don't meet that target that you uh, uh, impose to yourself. So that's why I'm saying and the only measure that is mentioned, the real measure by the directive is the positive action during the selection process that uh, women will have the advantage if there are two, for example, candidates, equal qualifications, yeah. yes. So, uh, in the narrow sense, this is not a classical quota. Why? Because if here, uh, this issue, this target, members of underrepresented sex have to hold at least 40% of non-executive, would be followed by section, a sanction, or this one, alternative, that would be a classical quota. But because you have... Uh, you have the opportunity, if you are not subject of this second part, of this second alternative, to, uh, uh, to uh, put your own target. That's why I'm saying it is not the quota in the narrow sense. Yeah, but uh, as I understood, should my target as the CEO of a company be to oblige by this directive of European Union or no? I mean... Yes. Or... Yes, but it is not by the directive directly. So member states so will propose the rules. So they will accept one of these alternatives. Subjects, uh, companies which are not subject to the alternative which uh, leads to the all, which covers all the uh, director positions, including so both executive and non-executive, have to put their own individual quantitative objective. And there is a sanction only if that is not uh, met. Why I'm saying this? Because if you would say it is obligatory to have 32, 33 directive positions uh, of both executive and non-executive, what would happen, for example, if no women of the equal qualification of, as men would apply? How you can meet your target. Sometimes it may be impossible. Or, for example, you have shareholders who need to vote. They don't want to vote for that women, for example. So you need to have some other, let's say, softer approach. And that is why you have this individual quantitative objective. So you should meet that criteria because you said, I can do this.
And uh, it is much easier to do that for the non-executive positions than to the executive positions. So in the legal theory, they say that this is not quite a target, uh, quite a, a quota as we all think what the quota is. But the quota, in some sense, of course it is. And it is called quota. But I'm saying the measure is a positive action. That is the only measure. Because you have to do something. And the all other things, it's not you have to do that or you will uh, have some sanctions. But if there are sanctions for these, uh, these three things that I uh, mentioned, and this is the uh, individual quantitative objectives, uh, means to achieve the objectives and the reporting, then you will, uh, uh, there are going to be some sanctions. Uh, those are, for example, fines, the possible ones, or there, uh, there may, uh, be, may be a sanction of annulment of decision on directors. And that is, again, some completely controversial topic. If you have uh, company law rules, uh, which are accepting only the removal, the replacement of the director when there is some uh, reason, some uh, justification, then how can you uh, replace the director to meet the criteria set by uh, your management, for example? That is a problem. In Serbia, we don't have that problem because we can uh, dismiss directors without a reason. So we can meet this. Of course, uh, we will, I believe, have some amendments in our law because, of course, we need to harmonize our law with EU law. And this is the newest, the newest rules. So I agree, this is a quota, but not the quota in the narrowest sense. Uh, in order it to be the quota in narrowest sense, then those two first alternatives that I told you, the 45% and 33% uh, of both positions and 45% uh, 40 regarding the non-executive positions should be in case of non-fulfillment followed by sanctions, which is not the case. Yes? So I want to make one comment which uh, represents a kind of a digression, but I think it's important to be said because uh, I'm thinking now that all these two, two weeks we did not mention that. So it's not a matter, in, an internal matter of EU company law, gender equitable taxation, uh, even gender economics, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, it is a matter of uh, gender equality in general and in these particular fields. The fact, namely, that we are speaking, so we are speaking about quotas, quantitative, qualitative analysis, but we actually essentially are speaking about so small percentage of women speaking globally and speaking in total about uh, women nowadays because we are, we are talking only about the so-called winners, women, female winners of globalization. So everything of this is very important, but also is uh, extremely important that all the time we have in mind this issue, how that proportion of the winners of globalization belong much, much more to women. And are there any data about how many women, proportionally speaking, and women in total have been uh, involved into this business law framework? I'm sure very small, but are there any statistical data globally and also in our country? How many? Yes, women? yes, they are, uh, but those are presented by the states, so uh, not uh, globally in all EU, but uh, from the country to country and in Serbia. So uh, as I uh, uh, showed you, in Serbia the situation is not quite, let's say, good, because uh, the latest uh, data's, uh, data is from uh, 2018, and it is only 19% of uh, women in boards of the listed companies. No, I'm not speaking about percentage of women 
which have been involved into the business law, business framework, and then about their, but I think that it's very important that we at this spring school and generally we who have been dealing with the issue of gender and diversity and inclusiveness to be aware how small percentage of female population, population globally okay. uh, at nation states levels locally so that's very important because yes. we are we are all the time how to say in the nutshell of of a close framework rather close and much better so even if they are there in small percentages they belong to the uh, world of uh, success yes so I that's, that's my that's my point yes, we but I don't have never we did not mention that all the time so i apologize but i had to mention I this understand. because we cannot think about business law taxation eco economics etc if we do not have this this perspective in this context in, in mind. I understand, but I don't have any such statistics in the global no, level. Uh, yes. That yes, yes. So, uh, my last question uh, for you, there are so many topics, unfortunately, I told you there is also international trade and, and investment and there was such, uh, there was one, such an interesting case, which I wanted to uh, talk about, which is still pending, actually, uh, Mexico and US are uh, um, are having some dispute and this was very important but unfortunately I think that we won't have time for that but uh, I would just uh, tell you uh, one more interesting interesting thing regarding the uh, uh, transparency of uh, remuneration uh, did you ever uh, hear for a ratcheting effect this is something which is very uh, has very negative a context in the business law. But the only positive one uh, that it may be uh, related to in business law is actually uh, regarding the transparency of remuneration of directors. Because the largest, these big companies, listed companies, they uh, need uh, to uh, disclose the remuneration of director. And so, for example, if this is a top level uh, director who is man and who, who, uh, whose uh, remuneration is uh, really huge, and if this is published, when you appoint to women also as a director, uh, uh, the company would not like uh, to, uh, to it will think about its reputation and they will maybe give the same or at and or a similar amount of money to the women of the same position and that's why we are talking about a ratcheting effect ratcheting effect i i hope that you maybe this is word in english is uh, is uh, is strange in serbian ricochet so it's it's uh, it's the same so if you give a huge amount of money to men because of the company's reputation, you will have to give a huge amount to the women because this has to be transparent. And this is something which is good and which we uh, all need to, for example, know. Uh, the, uh, in the companies, uh, the problem is because I told you the shareholders has the rights. Of, it's not a problem. It's actually normal and regular thing in the companies to vote who will be the directors and, of course, to vote on the remuneration policy. And uh, lately, many things have been done uh, to improve the activism of shareholders also. And uh, therefore, in 2017, uh, the shareholders directive, the second one, was also adopted. And there, the remuneration policy and uh, remuneration report uh, are uh, uh, the reports and the policy which has to be available to the company's website. This, those are the good things, and I wanted to say something good. Uh, do we have time for only that one small example, maybe, for the international trade law? Because, yes. So uh, I wanted to have this discussion. Uh, what do you think about the quotas? So uh, should they be uh, recommended or not? 
what do you think about that? Because this is only when we are not talk talking about the EU, but the globe is much bigger. So what do you think about that? And uh, is it too intrusive for the executive directors? What do you think about your own right to invest? Uh, that was the one thing. And the other, uh, I want to share the other slide. That's why I am uh, trying to uh, find it. Uh, let me see. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I will put this one to stop creating and I will share the other one. If uh -huh, it is not open, but I will find this. Don't worry. Here it is. Uh, mm -hmm. So I don't know now why can we we cannot see this other slide I want to share. She had not the problem. To sam probala baš upravo. Ja sam htjela ovaj da šerujem. Možda ipak da zovnemo Daneta, jer sam ja otvorila oba ova slajda. Ja ću ovaj da zatvorim. I did it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so uh, let me just say that there are two other topics uh, that are really important and uh, interesting, first of all, uh, especially regarding the trade agreements, uh, because today uh, many regional trade agreements, izvinjavamo se danetu, uh, many regional trade agreements, actually, uh, they include some provisions on the gender. So these provisions, uh, maybe, for example, in the preamble, maybe in the annex, maybe in various places of the agreements. And there are even some agreements which are dedicated to the gender. So they cover, for example, some gender policy, uh, dedication for the education of women, and so on and so on. So one uh, interesting uh, trade agreement was this uh, USMCA agreement between USA, Mexico and Canada, uh, which requires the parties to pursue policies that prevent all forms of gender discrimination in the work play, uh, workspace. The problem with these regional trade agreements uh, is that in most cases, individuals may not address to these agreements itself. So the country needs to see the uh, problem and then uh, to initiate some uh, mechanism, mechanism to uh, settle the dispute. But in this agreement that I mentioned, there is a possibility uh, that everyone may, initiate, uh, may uh, submit the public submission and then the state decides to uh, initiate the proceedings. So what happened? This was a really interesting case and it is still pending. Two Mexican women uh, and also various NGOs, they filed the complaint that US was discriminating against women uh, with its visa uh, regime. Uh, U.S. has two visa regimes. Uh, one is uh, actually uh, granted for temporary seasonal agricultural workers, uh, and uh, the other one uh, is uh, given for the non-agricultural workers, which uh, cover jobs with fewer benefits than, uh, and lower pay. As you may suggest, 90% of this better visa regime is granted to men. So what happened? Two Mexican women, they applied many times for this better uh, visa uh, regime, but they were rejected and they were sufficiently qualified. And what happened? They received, they were granted by the other visa regime and they faced some 
abuse and uh, sexual harassment at the workplace. And in this uh, uh, trade agreement that I told you, regional one, there were uh, U.S. and Mexico, uh, there was, was one section which was covering the labor law and the workplace and everything. So this was uh, initiated by those two women uh, who actually submitted uh, the uh, public submission, submission uh, because they faced, uh, as I told you, sexual harassment and abuse in the ver workplace. So they called Mexican uh, authorities to ensure that U.S. Uh, and Mexico develop cooperative activities which address gender-related measures uh, uh, on the field of labor and employment, including the discrimination based on sex in respect of employment, occupation and wages. Uh, why do you do this? Because then one state uh, call, uh, calls the another, another one for the labor consultations. If this doesn't work, then you can, of course, to settle the dispute in the other way. So many of these, not many, but some of these uh, trade agreements, uh, they also include uh, the uh, dispute uh, uh, settlement mechanisms, which is not so, let's say, uh, which is not so popular, but if, you, if they do cover them and uh, they, uh, they can't settle their dispute amicably, uh, this will be settled by the provisions of these agreements outside of the WTO so uh, mechanism. So this is very interesting, but again, uh, just a brief introduction. So this happened. And... Uh, Two years have passed. I have checked again yesterday. Uh, this case is still not uh, settled, but what one protocol actually uh, was concluded uh, between uh, the uh, U.S. and Mexico, and they say this NGO that I was actually following for this case says that this is a huge achievement. So what do you think uh, about this case? So uh, two women, they applied for the better visa regime, all the time rejected, but they were granted with the, uh, this uh, visa regime for the, uh, mm, let's say, uh, with the lower uh, wages, uh, and they faced sexual, sexual harassment and abuse. And 90% of men are the persons grant granted with this better visa regime. What do you think about this case? Uh, do you think that this is uh, a good way to improve gender balance on some very, let's say, uh, uh, on some very um, exotic, in some exotic manner? Because this is uh, the international trade agreement. So you wouldn't expect that international trade ag agreement uh, uh, grants such rights to these women that they may apply. So they may submit uh, uh, this uh, petition, this request to their authorities. So this is very rare, but it exists. So would you think that this is a good example? And I would finish. I'm sorry, I see that Professor Kovacic is here. But there are so many topics and, you know, you, uh, we could talk many hours on this. So I would just like to hear uh, your opinion. So this is very rare situation. Uh, is this a good way to improve gender balance, uh, gender equality? And uh, also, do you think that after two years, nothing special happened, that this is let's say, the right way or not, or better something than nothing. So what do you think? Well, uh, it can be fruitful in a way that when such cases happen, they usually trigger changes. They're kind of set their precedent for some changes. What you said that we wouldn't expect, now after this, we would expect in other trade agreements. So this is the case. This, I would say ratcheting effect, but in completely different, different manner. Different, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So this is how I see yes. it. Yes, I completely agree. I think that this is a very important case, uh, and I hope that it will uh, end really soon. And of course, uh, that these two women uh, women will benefit from from it. But we will see what will Mexican authorities uh, do at the end. So uh, I would 
finish now. Professor Vodinovic is coming, so thank you very much. If you have some additional questions, uh, you can uh, send it, for example, on my email. If you have some questions regarding the materials also, and I hope that there is going to be some other opportunities to talk uh, again with you about these interesting uh, issues. Thank you, thank Elena, you. very much. <laughs> with this, we are uh, finishing the course uh, business law and gender equality. And uh, Professor Jubinka is here, but uh, I would ask our colleagues online not to accept. M maybe here we need 10 to 15, 15, 10 or 15 minutes. Is okay. I mean, I don't know what so 10 minutes break, please uh, wait for us. And it means that uh, at Quarter past 12 exactly, it is in 11 minutes, we will start with gender perspective in labor law. Thank you.